Well, welcome back. Uh, welcome to the first, uh, the first research session of the conference, uh, which looks at the uh, implications of the entry of big tech firms um, into finance. As we touched on uh, in the keynote by Jason Furman, the, uh, the business model of big tech firms is built around, data, uh, around the data that is generated from the direct interaction of users um, in the existing business lines. And this interaction um, gives rise to network effects where the more users flock to a particular platform, the more other users are attracted to that uh, platform as well. Um, and these network effects can give rise to uh, market power if they result in so-called walled gardens. Uh, and now, um, in this session, we will examine uh, the implications of data uh, and uh, the network effects uh, for financial services. And we have uh, the two perfect speakers for this session, both straddle theory and practice. Uh, both speakers started out in academia but they're now well known as practitioners, uh, really at the top of their games. Um, the first is Jorge Padilla. Uh, he's a, a senior managing director of the consulting firm uh, Compass Lexicon, and is one of the leading experts on competition issues, especially um, in the European context. And he's the author of many influential academic papers uh, in industrial organization. Uh, and he's going to present his paper, uh, Big Tech Banking, which focuses on the implications for the banking sector, uh, and in particular, the future shape of the banking sector itself. Uh, our second speaker is uh, Karen Croxon. Um, uh, she's an economist by training. Uh, she also started out in academia. Uh, she's now in the official sector as the head of research at the UK Financial Conduct Authority, uh, where she leads a team of um, economists and data scientists on a range of issues that are really uh, very relevant for, the, uh, uh, for, for our conference, including consumer protection uh, and, and business conduct. And Karen's gonna present her, um, her paper, including with some BIS co-authors, on the public policy implications of uh, platform-based business models in finance, uh, with a focus on, um, on financial inclusion. So we'll kick off with uh, Jorge. Uh, Jorge, please, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. It's a real honor. So as uh, you have just mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the positive and the negative effects of the entry of big tech platforms into banking. And I want to talk also about whether there are ways in which we could regulate big tech so that we can balance those positive and negative effects to the benefits of society. In particular, therefore, I'm going to structure my presentation in two parts. First, I'll talk about the effects on competition and financial stability of the entry of big techs into banking. And the second part and last part of this presentation will focus on whether and how to regulate big tech in so far as they operate into banking. So let me go to the effects on competition and financial stability. As it has been mentioned already in, this, in today's session, big tech platforms possess significant competitive advantages that they have used and can use to leverage onto other markets. And in particular, that they can successfully use to leverage into retail banking. They have large installed customer bases. They possess powerful brands. They have very significant earnings. Their capitalization is striking. Unfettered access to capital markets. But above all, and most importantly, superior information about consumers' preferences, habits, and conduct, data. As regards banking, they also benefit or may benefit from a regulatory asymmetry when competing with established banks. And I'm not referring exclusively to the fact that traditional banks will be regulated uh, from a prudential perspective but also that um, uh, traditional banks in many jurisdictions, certainly in the Europe and in the UK and in other jurisdictions, are now required to share considerable amounts of information with third party competitors. Whereas big tech uh, platforms are, as of today, requested to share data, but only to a much limited extent, only when it is technologically possible and in ways that do not require constant access to that data and do not require that access to be mediated through 
application program interfaces that make the data sharing very easy. Not surprisingly, big tech uh, platforms have grown their share into banking, in particular in two areas, payment systems and consumer and SME lending. Their entry is likely to have positive effects on competition, is likely to enhance competition, at very least in the short term, and to the benefit of consumers. They will innovate in terms of the products that are available and may reach out to unbank customers that otherwise would not be included into the financial system. They may enter in different ways. They may enter as intermediaries in direct competition with incumbents. They may enter as marketplaces that get in touch, consumers, borrowers, with uh, the banks. One way or another, what they are likely to do in the first instance is to provide more choice to consumers. And to the extent that they have and possess significant amounts of hard and soft information, they may dilute the competitive advantages of incumbent banks, which stem mainly from the possession of soft information about their borrowers, and in so doing, they may lead to more competition. Not everybody agrees, however. A very recent and interesting paper by a few authors from the University of Chicago indicate that the effect on competition may depend on whether or not there is a level playing field from the viewpoint of the data from borrowers that traditional banks and big tech platforms possess. If they operate on a level playing field, meaning that they have access to similar data, then the entry of big tech platforms ought to have an unambiguous positive effect of competi on competition. But if on the contrary, the big tech platforms have better data and are better able to process that data in order to assess the quality of the borrowers, then the result of their entry may be less competition, even in a static sense, as a result of uh, market power being in the hands of these big tech platforms with superior skills and information, and traditional banks being unable to exert a proper competitive con constraint due to their inferior data holdings. Whatever we think about the short-term effects of uh, big tech entry into competition, we need to look forward and consider the potential long-term effects. We have seen in the past in other industries how the entry of big tech platforms has initially disrupted the traditional business models and increased competition and enhanced choice. But we have seen also that over the long term, the big tech platforms have managed to monopolize those markets and then the good deal for consumers was over. The concern here is about the long term. Would the big tech platforms be able, like they have done in other industries, to monopolize the banking markets where they participate, and in particular, not just payment systems, but also the origination and distribution of loans to consumers. There are reasons to think that they may do so, because these platforms have all the assets that I mentioned before, and especially information about borrowers that banks may not have. Traditional banks then risk being transformed into commodities, into narrow banks that basically play no role in the origination of distribution and limit themselves to fan the loans generated by the big techs. And if so, this would be particularly troublesome because it is payment systems and it is the origination and distribution of loans to consumers and to SMEs that provides or they represent one of the main sources of profits for traditional banks. These are the areas where the return on capital employed exceeds the cost of capital. And therefore, if banks are cornered in this particular way, they may end up being unable to survive. And that may accelerate the process of monopolization of the markets. 
Now, you may say this is too dramatic. Banks enjoy a lot of uh, uh, competitive advantages. They also have installed bases. They have reputations. They have powerful brands. They may be more trusted than big tax by uh, depositors and borrowers and consumers. And they have lots of soft uh, information. But maybe we should worry nonetheless, because other incumbents thought that they also were well protected against the entry of the big techs, and they did not. The experience shows that big tech platforms have been able to escalate their uh, businesses quite rapidly, very quickly, because of their ability to tailor services to consumer preferences. These considerations are not relevant exclusively from a competition perspective. They have prudential implications. The entry of big tech platforms may have a significant impact on financial stability. If I'm right, and the result of their entry may be that banks are become narrow banks and that the origination and distribution of loans is in the hands of the big tech platforms, that involves a decoupling between origination and funding that has proved troublesome in the past. From the savings and loans crisis to the crisis in 2008, we have seen that when those that originate and distribute have no stake, has no real stake on the loans that they originate, moral hazard is a real issue. And it's not just that these platforms may not have proper incentives to restrict credit and monitor the nature and quality of the projects that they fund to screen loans properly. It may be also that banks in this new scenario also see their incentives to screen reduced. Moral hazard is one of the problems, but there may be also problems related with adverse selection. Big tech platforms may have incentives to bring into the market borrowers of uh, low quality, borrowers that are not credit worthy, because of uh, the sales that uh, the ancillary sales that these big tech platforms may make with those borrowers. Originating loans because they can sell them products, originating uh, loans because they can provide them with other services. And because of their superior information and their superior ability in order to process that information, they may end up leaving to banks those borrowers that are of inferior quality, generating, therefore, a shift risking uh, issue that may undermine the viability of the traditional banks. So what do we do very quickly? Should we ban big tech entry? I think that that would be a mistake. As Professor Furman mentioned before, it's not that everything is okay with traditional finance or traditional banking. There is market power, and there are concerns about market power, and big tech entry may promote competition. But there is a bad side to big tech entry. The potential relaxation of competition in the short term the more risky relaxation of competition in the long time, and the financial stability problems that I mentioned before. How do we deal with this? The status quo doesn't seem to be an option. Some people advocate, in particular traditional banks, for activity-based regulation. Same activity, same regulation. Constrain big tax in the same way that you do constrain us, they call uh, regulators. They said to regulators. A recent, recent sets of papers uh, indicate that perhaps we should look for a mixed approach with some activity-based regulation and some entity-based regulation. I think that an element of entity-based regulation is particularly important, not only because in some activities traditional banks may be different, that they will take deposits, they will be banks, whereas big tech firms are unlikely to get into that area of business but also because big tech platforms have specificities that need to be tackled directly. And in this respect, I want to conclude by referring to two types of intervention that I consider central if we want to make sure that we take the most 
out of the entry of big tech platforms into banking and limit the potential risks of such entry. And these two interventions concern data because this is the key dimension of superiority that may uh, lead to the problems that I mentioned before. And one possibility is actually to mandate big tech platforms to share some of the data that they possess so that we generate a level playing field informationally between traditional banks and uh, big techs. And of course, this could raise all sorts of privacy concerns, and I'm going to leave them aside. But the important thing is that if we mandate data, we need to do it in such a way that that data sharing is effective. GDPR is not enough. We need to be more intrusive. We need to do with, if, if, if we go in this route, we need to do with big tanks what we meant to do, or we are still trying to do, I guess, or striving to do with traditional banks, which is to get them to share on a continuous basis, on an easily accessible basis, through standardized APIs, the data that they possess that is relevant for competition in these markets. The DMA was mentioned in the initial uh, presentation by Agustin, and the DMA goes to some extent in this direction. But as I will argue in a second, it's likely to be insufficient. It is just requiring uh, banks to share data uh, and, and, and facilitate the portability of data, and also to facilitate um, the uh, sharing data that is generated in their platforms but by banks or the users. But it includes too many caveats. Perhaps concerns about privacy explain those caveats. But these caveats may limit the effectiveness of this remedy. An alternative to data sharing is data unbundling. Is to say, look, Don, okay, fine. You we're not going to require you to share data that you have collected through your platforms say through your mobile operating system, through your search engine, through your social network with the banks. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna restrict your ability to combine personal and transaction data from those platforms with the personal and transaction data that you may get from the banks or you may get while conducting your financial activities. So that we put you at a level playing field with less data. Data sharing is everybody's on a level playing field, but with more data, this would be you are not going to be able to leverage your data superiority in adjacent markets into banking. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to get into all details. This has also problems and difficulties. On the one hand, there may be, we may be incurring into what is called an efficiency offense, preventing the combination of data that would allow uh, big tech banks and also bank, traditional banks, to offer better services. But the main problem is how we implement this unbundling. Precisely because we may be concerned about restricting the combination of data too much, it is likely that the regulation goes in the direction of saying you shouldn't combine data unless there is consent. And that's precisely what the DMA in its current formulation, the DMA proposal does. But what is consent? And can we rely on consent? The answer, in my opinion, is no. I can consent sharing that uh, with my data. I can consent that my data from my bank is combined with the data that is collected from a platform. But that does not only have implications for myself. It has implications for lots of other people that have sociodemographic characteristics like mine. They are data externalities. Consent is problematic if the platform in question has a dominant position or a super dominant position. If I'm told, unless you give us permission to combine data from this platform with your financial data, you're not gonna be able to access the platform. And that platform is essential for my communication, my socializing, etc. I'm likely to provide consent. Consent may not be enough. 
and therefore the effectiveness of this data unbundling proposal may be limited, pushing us again in the direction of data sharing. One last comment. It seems to me that we need regulation to ensure that there is a level playing field between big tech platforms and, 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 and banks so that we can take advantage of the entry of big tech platforms in a sustained way. But we need to be careful not to overregulate. If we do, big tech platforms may shy away from entering into these markets, may think it is not worthwhile to enter into finance if the result of this is that I need to put, to distribute, to share with, uh, with lots of people the data that makes or ensures that I retain a leadership position, a leading position in my platform. If they shy away from entry, we may end up in the, in the worst of all possible worlds, which is one in which the big tech platforms and the banks do not compete, but they each stay in their separate markets, collaborating, even sharing data, but not competing. That would be the terrible scenario for me. And one that I don't think is pure science fiction. I don't know what has motivated Google's recent decision a couple of days ago of scrapping its plans to offer bank accounts to users. But there are those that say that one of the reasons is that it feared regulation. There is an alternative explanation, which is that they do business with banks and didn't want to annoy some banks because they were collaborating with others. But the risk that the uh, regulation, that the threat of regulation deters entry is something that we also need to worry about. So unfortunately, life is not easy and we need to find the golden middle point to regulate not too little, but not too much. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jorge. Uh, that was very clear. Um, so why don't we um, uh, collect the question at the end and uh, uh, we can move straight to Karen. Karen? Thank you, here, let me um, just sh see if I can share this. The slides are up. Oh, they're up. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, so um, thanks so much, Jan, and, and thanks, Jorge, for a, a, a truly fascinating presentation. Thanks very much for the invitation to be here. It's really great to be part of this event today. Um, so today I'm going to be presenting fairly briefly a forthcoming paper on platform-based business models and financial inclusion. This is joint work with John Frost and Leonardo Gambacorta at the Bank for International Settlements, and also with Tommaso Valletti at Imperial. Uh, Tommaso previously served as the Chief Competition Economist of the European Commission's Directorate General for Competition. I should just say up front that these are very much the views of ourselves as the authors and not necessarily those of the, the BIS, the FCA, or the European Commission. Um, so what do we do in the paper? Well, briefly, we look at the growth of three types of platforms in finance, um, fintech firms, big tech firms, and also incumbent financial institutions getting into this model. And then we step back and ask what this means for financial inclusion potentially, but also for market structure. It's very much an applied research paper. We're deriving insights from the literature on platform economics and also from empirical work on digital finance. And really our hope is to inform the dialogue on policy. We were looking to promote financial inclusion, but also thinking about uh, protecting consumers, promoting good competition, financial stability, and, and other key public policy goals. So let's just jump straight in and talk about um, the types of platforms we see in financial services. So we see broadly three types uh, in digital finance. The first are fintech platforms. Now, these are often uh, focusing on a specific financial service. It could be payments, credit, insurance, wealth management. Um, they're really bringing together and matching two groups, such as users and merchants, or perhaps borrowers and savers. A second type uh, we see are the big tech platforms, like those listed here in the, uh, in the middle column. These are firms whose 
primary activity is really uh, digital services such as social media, e-commerce, internet search, uh, telecommunications, could be ride hailing, and then who expand from there into um, financial services. And finally, there are some incumbent players in uh, financial services now adopting more of a platform-based business model as well, uh, making greater use of big data and, and automation. In many cases, these incumbents uh, are offering third-party services to their clients, such as digital payments, credit insurance, perhaps wealth management. And the model is sometimes called uh, banking as a service here. It really in entails quite a change to the traditional business model, with the incumbent now functioning uh, more as a matchmaker in some aspects of the offer um, rather than a traditional intermediary. So what defines platforms is really that they operate in, in these two-sided or perhaps multi-sided markets. Here's a, a really simple representation. Uh, whereas in a conventional market, you have buyers and sellers. Here you have buyers, sellers, but also the matchmaker in the middle, the platform. And we see platform-based business models now in a number of sectors, of course, of the modern digital economy. Examples include ride-hailing apps, uh, matching drivers and passengers, perhaps a, a hospitality platform bringing together apartment owners and, uh, and, and tourists will be familiar to many of us. Over in financial services, it could be borrowers and savers on an app. Uh, it could be retail clients and financial service providers on social media, search or e-commerce platforms. Now, a key thing to note is here is the uh, the potential for externalities, and Hyun, uh, you touched on this already. The value to a participant of being on the platform uh, can increase significantly with the number of others on the other side of the market. So, as this network scales, you get a higher a lot of good things happen. You get a higher probability of finding a trading partner, finding the right match, and so on. Now, digital platforms in particular may be particularly effective at some of this, about, you know, using that data and technology edge to overcome search and matching frictions. Um, really, um, uh, we may see here some, some quite strong uh, positive network effects. But then, of course, there's also the risk uh, of some concentration. You know, perhaps these markets tip over uh, in favor of dominant platforms, and that's a, a consideration uh, discussed in the literature. Now, the literature points to um, a few ways of countering concentration uh, where platforms are concerned, and we discuss a few of these in the paper. Uh, one is that competitors uh, may pursue differentiation strategies. Um, this could moder moderate a bit of a winner-takes-all or winner-takes-most outcome if you think of, say, a smaller platform potentially offering better quality services uh, to the market or catering to particular consumers or consumer groups. So you may then see multiple players uh, coming into the market or staying in the market for this reason. Although worth saying that there may not be um, a huge amount of competition for any one individual uh, user or segment. Multi-homing uh, can help here a lot. So this is where users uh, might utilize more than one platform. Uh, this could play a key role. So think about uh, multiple meeting platforms that many of us use. You've got WebEx, Zoom, Hangouts, and so on, and we switch between them. This kind of multi-homing can, can really cut through concentration, uh, can allow some competition among platforms. But in the real world, you know, there may be some limitations to multi-homing and the effectiveness of that if you have things like behavioral barriers to having more than one subscription, to really getting out there and comparing uh, these platforms are actively and switching. Um, it may also be that only one side of the market can really uh, multi-home and not the other. And, and finally, of course, regulatory intervention could also be used to counter concentration. In particular, we call out platform interoperability, where the users of one platform can interact with the users of another. This could play uh, a similar role to multi-homing, helping us societally to preserve those positive externalities of platforms um, while still ensuring that these are really available to all at the industry level and, and don't accrue uniquely to a single firm. I'm going to get back to interoperability uh, just a bit later. So what's really Karen, unique yeah, can, about... Can I just uh, jump in here? I, I think we, we need to synchronize the slides. Um, maybe ah, okay. uh, if you uh, share your slides on WebEx... Um, I think we can, oh, we can okay, also synchronize okay, here. Okay, okay. I'm so sorry. Uh, I kind of uh, had lapsed into thinking I was sharing them. Yeah, just Let hold me, on a moment. Yeah. yeah, sorry to jump in. No problem. It's a good intervention. Thanks. So, okay, I'm sharing now. Let me know if this is okay for you. 
Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for that. So what's unique about digital platforms? Well, quite a few things, and, and this is obviously uh, something with complex considerations, uh, and we mustn't lose sight of the positive. But so first, digital platforms may harness powerful data and technology uh, to lower the cost per user. Um, these powerful network externalities can kick in. There may be then some gains from greater financial inclusion uh, and some, va some really value creating innovation. But there are some potential uh, other considerations as well uh, to, to, to get into. So the panels in this picture, I won't go through it in great detail, but really what we're doing here is we're comparing for a bunch of different market structures, consumer surplus, monopoly surplus, and total welfare to really explore the potential effects of a possible digital monopoly that could emerge. So in the first panel here on the left, you just have classic perfect competition, lots of firms, they're all price takers, the market's clearing nicely at point A with this downward sloping demand curve um, where that meets the horizontal supply. And there's this single price, you know, PC for, for those with good eyesight that is equal to the marginal cost. Now, lots of consumers here are enjoying a surplus because they value the product at more than the price they they actually need to pay for it with this uniform pricing. And we've got this total consumer surplus here in the blue triangle. Now, if we shift into the second panel, that's just traditional monopoly. We've got a, a monopolist there maximizing profit, setting a somewhat higher single price, PM. And here we see that price is a bit above marginal cost. The quantity overall is lower. We may lose some financial access off the back of that. But still, we see some consumer surplus, the, uh, the smaller blue triangle now in the second panel, um, but also a monopoly sur surplus. Um, uh, and this is the red triangle, uh, sorry, the red rectangle. So what happens in a digital monopoly? Um, well, let's explore a few potential effects, uh, looking first at panel three. So here, the digital monopoly harnesses data and technology to lower the cost per user, but it also uses big data and sophisticated algorithms to predict individual willingness to pay uh, and implement very powerful price discrimination. So here we can have two effects. Um, firstly, the, the overall triangle here is expanding and financial access is, has grown. Some of those previously priced out of the market can now get in there and, and, and consume in a way that is affordable to them. But the powerful price discrimination I describe means that the monopoly, the digital monopoly, is capturing the full social surplus generated here in this, in this very stylized extreme case. So to be clear, you know, this outcome is very efficient, actually, from an economic point of view. But when each of us pays exactly our willingness to pay for, say, a flight ticket or an insurance policy, um, we may not be uh, entirely thrilled about it. And so the pie has grown overall, but we're also seeing an element of value extracting innovation in this scenario. And then finally, looking at this, this far right panel four, um, a further possibility uh, here that we consider in the paper is that a digital platform may also use big data and analytics, maybe a dose of uh, behavioral science to, to understand and exploit consumers' behavioral biases, uh, possibly even to manipulate preferences. Now, this could lead uh, consumers, say, to overestimating the benefits of the service to them or paying more than their reservation price for it. And perhaps there's an element of uh, sharing valuable personal data to access the service, which is not so well understood. So in this case, um, you know, look here at the pink sliver, uh, if you can, there, we're saying there's, an, there, there's something of, of a perception gap that can arise and some potential detriment to consumers. The overall outcome is inefficient here. There's some, there's some um, overconsumption of the, of the service and there's uh, a sense in which there's some value destroying innovation going on here with, with all this data and technology. And I think this links very, very well to uh, some of the points that Jorge was making about predicting consumer behavior, habits and preferences, and both the great things that can come from that and some of the risks we have to think about. So, um, so let's, uh, let's move on into what we're actually seeing in practice. I'll just spend a few minutes on, on some of the evidence. Um, so this slide, I think you've seen already in uh, Jorge's uh, presentation as well. So we can confirm with some actual evidence that platforms scale fast. Um, big tech credit has expanded particularly rapidly with total lending volume um, hitting nearly 600 billion US dollars globally in 2019. 
the uh, early indications are that it grew further in 2020 during the pandemic, uh, and that was even as fintech credit shrank. And in some markets like Kenya, China, and Indonesia, big tech credit is a, a economically significant share of overall credit. Digital payment apps are seeing rising adoption around the world. In advanced economies, it's especially the fintech apps like PayPal and Venmo that are taking off. Over in emerging market economies, it tends to be more the big tech apps like Alipay, uh, WeChat Pay, Google Pay, and PhonePay. In many cases, the innovation has been associated with some progress in financial inclusion. Here we show uh, just the percentage of adults with a transaction account and how this has developed over time in different uh, regions of the world. Here in the UK, we're seeing some positive signs about financial inclusion from things like indicators in our FCA Financial Live Survey. Um, got a couple of plots from that here. In the left panel, we're looking at the share of adults using mobile apps for day-to-day -day banking. We can see that this rose across the board between 2017 and 2020, uh, with relatively large gains for women. Usage has also increased among adults with characteristics of vulnerability um, in the areas of health, life events, resilience, and capability. And over on the right-hand side, we see the share of adults who are digitally excluded fell in the same period. And there have been some gains in digital inclusion among older cohorts too, although we do still see large shares of, of users in that demographic, the over 65s are digitally excluded. So this remains an area of ongoing uh, concern. We're also seeing a tendency towards greater concentration. In China, there's a duopoly in mobile payments. Elsewhere in payments, we see mergers and activities acquisitions activity taking off. Here in the plot, we're showing M&A activity by selected global payment platforms. And we see that this has proliferated since 2017. There's a, a really interesting recent paper by Kamapali, Rajan and Zingalis, which shows that the mere threat of acquisition may re reduce VC funding for new firms. And this is because investors anticipate that um, startups will be bought out before they can really build a sufficiently large network. So this is one of many um, potential competition concerns. And as mentioned already, some incumbent financial institutions have moved towards more of a platform based model, or if you like banking as a service, they're offering third party services to users and, and, and acting as a matchmaker. So in this case, we'd expect to see some shift in their revenue base towards fees uh, and also some stronger investments in digital technology. Um, here on this slide, uh, we take a look at that. There isn't really an objective classification uh, that we can use to look at this, but we're looking here at non-interest income of platform-based banks, and, and we see that this is higher than their non-platform peers. The expenditure on technology is also higher. So in both these slides, it's about the red line being um, significantly above the uh, blue line. So overall, we argue in the paper that the, the, the same forces that allow platforms to enhance financial inclusion, potentially bring, you know, a huge amount of benefit can also, uh, you know, bring a risk of tipping of markets, the potential for some market dominance. If our goal uh, is to harness the benefits from innovation and platforms for things like efficiency and inclusion, whilst also mitigating the broad range of risk, then, I, you know, it's fair to ask what, what policy can really do. In the um, paper, we discuss three approaches to this. The first option we, we discuss is simply uh, applying the existing rules. Uh, many authorities explicitly adopt a same business, same risk, same rules approach, where they're dealing with new entrants or incumbents. Um, so this would mean applying the same licensing, regulatory reporting, uh, and so on provisions to both fintech and big tech, for instance. Uh, where needed, the authorities like, might try then to fit new models into existing regulatory uh, definitions and categories. Now, there are some challenges potentially with this. Um, financial regulation and competition law may not always be agile enough to prevent concentration. There can be trade-offs between policy goals that, that need to be worked through. Um, new platforms, particularly big techs, may have informational advantages. Uh, some of this could relate to the asymmetries in data regulation that I, I believe Jorge referred to already. And there's the potential um, for some systemic uh, importance uh, here as well uh, on the part of the big techs. A second approach is to then adapt the existing regimes and adopt some new rules in financial regulation, data protection and competition policy. 
So new financial regulation and competition rules may be explicitly tailored to platforms. Um, I've got some examples here on the on the page. It might be some new licenses, such as those we're seeing for virtual banks in in uh, South Korea, China, Hong Kong, and Chinese Taipei, enhancing competition through APIs and other tools to enhance data portability. Uh, examples include the UK and EU open banking here, and also developing new ex ante regimes, uh, such as the Digital Markets Unit uh, here in the UK. Enhancing interoperability can be particularly powerful. In the paper, we have a box on the experience with telecoms in the EU on this. And data protection rules, though they're broader than financial services and cut across many sectors, they can impact on competition and financial stability. Um, and we've got GDPR uh, and a data minimization principle then, which, um, which limits the volume of data collected. There can be some considerations there for other goals. Uh, and over in California, we've got the California Consumer Protection Act defining sanctions for data breach, breaches that would also be relevant for those with uh, where, where financial data is concerned. Finally, uh, uh, but not necessarily mutually exclusively, I, we're talking in the paper about um, the role of uh, provision of public infrastructure here as a further option. Private sector platform services are often built on a public sector infrastructure. We've got some examples here on the page with uh, government ID initiatives and enhancements to real-time growth settlement systems and retail fast payment systems. Public infrastructures uh, could help facilitate entry and bring about greater competition between the platform providers. Uh, you could think of retail central bank digital currencies in this light as well. So just to wrap up, as noted uh, already, platform-based business models are changing market structure in financial services. Uh, fintech and big tech entrants are booming. Some incumbents are adopting more of a platform model as well. We know from the literature on platform economics that platforms can be highly scalable. Um, platforms collect, uh, may collect huge amounts of data uh, across a, a variety of contexts and business lines. There can be significant network effects and economies of scale and scope and huge potential uh, you know, value creation here from a societal point of view. Um, but the same forces can support um, uh, both financial inclusion, but also potentially some tipping and, and concentration in markets to really capture the benefits for goals like efficiency and inclusion and mitigate some of these risks I've talked about to fair competition, data protection, financial stability and beyond. Then authorities can choose between three approaches. Um, apply existing rules, um, adapt existing regimes, and adopt new and more forward-looking rules in, in some of these areas. And thirdly, not mutually exclusively, uh, provide some public infrastructure uh, where examples might be digital ID and faster payments. So thanks very much uh, for listening. And um, we, uh, I would say as well that in the paper, there's much more discussion, but I'll keep it short in the interest of time. We, we discuss how the latter two approaches may be uh, more promising uh, in this scenario, but really regardless of the approach chosen, we also emphasize that it's important for central banks and regulators with their mandates to work very closely with competition and data protection authorities, very much building on the existing mechanisms. So thank you for listening. Really look forward to joining Jorge and Hyun uh, and you all and taking any questions. And I should say as well that my co-authors, John, Leonardo and Tommaso are also here and, and, and may well want to uh, chime into that discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, and thank you, Jorge, for, the, for that very rich discussion. Um, so let me open the floor and invite questions. Um, Let's, um, let's go first to uh, Fernanda Restoy, uh, and then we'll go to uh, um, uh, Bert van uh, Rosbecker. And then we could al also invite uh, Karen's co-authors later at the end. So, Fernanda, the floor is yours. Could we get Fernando on the screen? hear me now? Yes. Go ahead, Fernando. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Kiona. Uh, thank you both, both speakers. Very, very insightful uh, presentations and very sensible uh, policy conclusions. Um, let me uh, ask uh, maybe a couple of questions to Jorge. Uh, oh, hello, Jorge. Good to see you again. Um, first, <laughs> I mean, you're, you have a very catchy title in your presentation, which is something like Big Tech 
banking. It's interesting because actually you were speaking for 25 minutes about big tech uh, banking. Uh, you cannot mention the word deposits. Uh, when you talk, think about banks in principle, you will think about you know these entities that take deposits and then they do other things like credit underwriting, payment services, and whatever, right? But, but deposits should be in the, I mean, should be sort of part of the core definition of the bank is about, right? And it's something that in principle uh, bank do, banks do, uh, most big techs don't. So, and this may actually have some some implications in terms of the analysis that you basically shared with with us first. Because we, when you think about the competitive advantage of banks vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, say, big techs, non-deposit taking uh, big techs, obviously, is precisely that, uh, well, banks can leverage on the complementarities between, you know, deposit taking, uh, credit underwriting, and particularly payment, payment services. So when you actually describe how this competitive position could evolve over time, and uh, taking into account that other players are now competing with banks in, in, in some uh, activities like uh, payment services, for instance, uh, do, do not mention whether, I mean, or, or you are not explicit about whether you feel that this complementarity between deposit taken and other activities will continue to be relevant in the future. That, that is key, I mean, to understand, I mean, what is the scope for, basically, for the regular commercial banks to disappear from the marketplace as a consequence of uh, the, com the, 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 new, uh, the new players, right? Um, also, the the, uh, idea, the point, the extent to which big techs do not take deposits also have implications in terms of the financial stability implications of the financial activities they perform. Um, to the extent, of course, there is no risk transformation in principle, that should also be relevant when you discover financial stability implications of the of, of market developments and, in particular, higher market quotas for for big uh, for big techs. So it, it would appreciate very much if you could actually tell us something about how you see actually this, the role as a deposit taker, how important this thing is in terms of explaining the evolution of the competitive position of banks, vis-a-vis -vis banks, and in terms of the financial stability analysis. And my second question, a very quick one. You mentioned that uh, you are concerned, I think you're rightly, you're rightly so, that compet I mean the, uh, the emergence of big techs and the competition that big techs actually generate in terms of in, in the market for, for lending, that could actually sort of generate some adverse distributional effects in terms of the quality of the borrowers. So banks would take the, the worst borrowers and, and, and big techs actually will be able actually to grab the good ones. But this is, is, I mean, apparently this is not what is actually happening in practice, right? I mean, if you take the, the, the example of China and the and what uh, Ant Group is actually doing, would you see that they are pretty much focusing on giving loans to previously unbanked uh, households in particular, right? So it's, they are basically working especially in the, on the extensive margin rather than the intensive uh, margin. So they are basically providing credit to, to, to borrowers that were excluded to the, to the, to the, to the banking market in the, in, in the past. So how would you actually assess that a small piece of, of evidence, how this will actually fit into your analysis? Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, thanks. Fernando. Let's um, uh, okay, let's uh, let's collect a couple of questions uh, uh, yeah. as we as we get to the end of the session. Uh, let's go to Bert. Bert has a question on uh, privacy. Thank you. Uh, my question, let me be very short, um, relates to one one issue that Jorge um, spoke about. So so data, right? So so um, I totally um, share your um, your your evaluation that data is is really important. Um, and something like an essential facility here, um, and and I would like to come back to your to your um, ideas on on data sharing, and and um, I must admit I have some problems seeing how this could ever work in practice, right? For questions like um, who do we make data available to at all? Would that like only be to the bank competitors of a big tech, um, uh, only to the big ones, or to all ones? And in which market would those companies have to be access uh, active? to receive access to that data. Which data are we speaking about anyway? Because big techs may be active in many, many, many different markets, ranging from search engines to social networks, and, and that's all kind of different data. So do we need to have a look in, like, in, the, in the value chain of banking to find out which data we would be interested in? Um, it's really complex. And then consent, 
um, which you mentioned. So you mentioned this data externalities. That's a great concept. Uh, so that's, that's really something really to think about. Um, but um, consent may be selective, right? So what if I, as an individual, would say, well, I'm happy to share my data, but only with that and that bank and not with another one? Is that something that we would be willing to accept? And what if people would share, well, uh, I can share my data, but I want to receive money for it? Right. Um, so the core legal question of who owns this data in any way. So all a lot of really difficult questions. And I was wondering whether you have any ideas on is there any any reasonable way to solve this? Right. Uh, and, and to actually give access um, to competitors to this data, which I totally agree upon is, is very, very important. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Bert. Mm -hmm. I think, um, um, Karen, this question is also very relevant for your presentation as well. And, uh, you know, on, on the broad uh, issue of data governance. Um, just conscious of the time, uh, maybe we can um, squeeze in Leonardo for, for one last uh, comment. Leonardo? Thanks, Yoon, uh, uh, um, and uh, thanks for this very relevant uh, question. I think that uh, uh, the optimality of sharing data is, uh, is extremely uh, important. And indeed, uh, it is at the center, center stage also of uh, regulatory actions in, in, in China, trying to design what is the, the optimal way the, uh, the, 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 uh, the data could be shared between the big tech and uh, the financial uh, institution. And this will be crucial because uh, uh, really, uh, I, I really think that uh, there are two uh, um, uh, open questions here. First is the technical design. Is it optimal? Uh, to, uh, to share the data and uh, uh, because uh, uh, financial institutions, they have uh, problems, problems uh, in terms of uh, uh, um, then organizing the da this data in terms of silos. And there is also uh, a question re regarding uh, optimality in terms of uh, uh, how to uh, not to destroy uh, solutions that are based on cross subsidies between, uh, between uh, the various, uh, uh, the various uh, uh, borrowers. So uh, this is a crucial question, and uh, and uh, and uh, I think that uh, uh, we we need to to answer with uh, both theoretical and empirical models. Excellent, um, Karen Jorge, the last words are yours. So Karen, would you like to go first? Uh, thanks, Jan, and, and thanks for these excellent uh, questions. I think on the on the you know there are a couple of questions here that relate to the data sharing and some of the challenges there about figuring out you know, what would really even be optimal and what the implications would be. I think this is, you know, this is a really important nested sort of set of open questions here. And I agree with you completely, uh, Leonardo, Leonardo, that uh, more theoretical and empirical work uh, are going to be needed on these topics. Um, you know, just to illustrate, you know, the, the full width of this, I guess, I think on the demand side as well, um, the consumer side really understanding um, how consumers value data uh, and perceive data, their trust in data sharing. Um, some of this could be very context specific. There's a little bit of a small uh, nascent part of the literature that has started to get into this, looking at this with uh, in some in some experiments, in some empirical settings. And um, it's quite nuanced. Some of the insights there is my take on, on that part of the literature. So that's just on the demand side. And then there are various questions, you know, about how you do this. Uh, in a way that really achieves those top line public policy goals of protecting consumers, promoting effective competition, and making sure the data protection is where it needs to be, making sure that we can meet other aims like financial stability, um, that where, um, where with that and competition, there may, but then it may need to be access to data um, in ways that have to be worked through because of some of the potential considerations for, for consumers and protection. So I think I'll leave it there. I think, you know, fascinating, uh, important, open questions on that. Excellent. Uh, Jorge. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks very much again for, for, for the questions. I agree with, uh, with Karen. They were, you know, very well pointed and, and, and all very relevant. I'll touch very briefly on, 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 on the issues raised by Fernando. So on, on deposits, I think that my, my, my first reaction to, to why is it that big tech platforms don't want to be uh, deposit taking institutions is that, um, is that actually there is nothing that uh, makes it impossible for them to do so. Uh, they, could, they could take licenses that they don't want to. 
Uh, and so I think that is, you know, using a reveal preference argument, it must be that the advantages that uh, that having those deposits confer do not compensate or offset the, the 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 regulatory burden that will be, you know, brought along with uh, with that with that decision. Now, definitely being able to operate with uh, in the deposit and on the on the credit side of 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 the of the banking business generate some complementarities that are positive. I mean, to some extent, you could argue that some of the soft information that banks have about uh, about their clients and potential borrowers stems from from the fact that they deal with them on the deposit side of uh, of the business. But again, you know, that's one form of soft information, and there are other forms of soft information that are in the hands of the big tech platforms that may be more than enough for them to be able to compete in those areas where they are really interested, which are the areas with the high uh, returns on capital employed. So, you know, I, I think that, uh, yeah, banks in Europe are much more likely, or in the US, much more likely to put up a fight with the big techs than, than, in, than in China, precisely because I think that the, the extent of, uh, of the bank population is greater. The relationships that banks in Europe and the U.S. have with their clients are much stronger and so on and so forth. And they possess, therefore, a stock of soft information and soft capital that, um, that uh, will protect them from the big techs in a way that perhaps has not been the case elsewhere. And that leads me to the China situation. I think that in China, the reason why we see, uh, you know, in my opinion, the big tax more on the extensive margin than in the intensive margin is because you have a, a different degree of penetration of traditional banks and you have, uh, you know, much less financial inclusion. Uh, I don't know how that would translate into, into Europe. And as I said, at this point, my concern is that I'm not even sure how the big tech plans are going to unfold with respect to to these, uh, to these issues. I mean, whether they are going to continue in the direction that they seem to go, which was more of confrontational with traditional banks, or they are going to accommodate, which perhaps worries me even more. And just to conclude, data is an essential facility. Uh, sharing data is very complicated. Uh, I think that to some extent, already a number of authorities have contemplated uh, how to do it in the context of, of open banking and the PSD2 directive, uh, where consent plays a role where there are uh, you know, complex uh, solutions. And I know that the story is not a, an unqualified success at the moment, uh, So, which means that it's a difficult thing. We need to keep uh, thinking about it. And I agree with Leonardo. I think that uh, we need to keep uh, you know, investigating the issue to see whether that, if that is the solution, how to implement it so that it proves effective. Excellent. Um, thank you, Hoya. Thank you, Karen, for setting us up so well for the, for the policy panel, which is going to follow uh, right afterward. We'll just go offline for one minute to, uh, to um, change the setup, but we'll come back as, uh, well, uh, I think in one minute, probably. So, um, so stay online. See you soon. <laughs>